What's going on guys, Waco from Revolution here with my friend Patrick Bruno, who is the CEO of Jara Perigo. How are you? I'm good, how are you, Wayne? So let's Thank talk you. about uh, one of the watches that's on the table in front of us, and it is the famous Constant Escapement, uh, launched initially in 2013. It is the winner of the Grand Prix de Horlogerie in Geneva uh, for the Aiguille d'Or because it is the very first watch that was created that impulses the oscillator every beat, and it is a revolution. I mean, tell me about that, sir. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually, as you know, it's. It's a, it was a revolution back then when we launched it. But it's also when you, we look back, it's a watch that was that we started to design, started to work on a, on a movement for almost 20 years ago. So the first iteration came in 2008 as a concept. In turn, and then we launched it in 2013, winning the Grand Prix largely. And we decided many years ago, actually six years ago, to uh, continue working on that movement and keep on improving it. The, uh, the movement is um, the geometry of the uh, of the movement is uh, is the same, but we uh, we had to change and we wanted to make it slightly smaller. Right. And we also wanted to take the benefits of the uh, uh, some of the uh, technology uh, changes that are taking place in the, uh, in the use of cesium uh, to use the same shape that we had, but actually change uh, slightly the geometry, but also change the uh, the thickness right. of the cesium. Um, so the couple of um, benefits to that, it's, it's obviously the movement, um, the watch shrank. I mean, we lost uh, three millimeters and it's a very balanced watch. It's 40, it's actually a 45 millimeter watch. But, um, but also now uh, it's extremely readable. Um, as you remember on the, on the previous version, it was not a central hand. And we now have that plus a seven days power reserve, to be honest. I mean, in a constant escapement, as far as I know, it's probably the, uh, the highest power reserve that's available. Right. Two yeah. massive barrels. It's such a cool looking watch, and, and I love the fact that you make it central hands now. Let's kind of step back in time a little bit and talk about the entire adventure of this watch. But I mean, let's also like kind of just give an analogy for this watch that's kind of easy to understand, right? Yeah. So uh, I like to think about it in the following way, and forgive me because I'm not a doctor, so I'm sure this is medically inaccurate, but it's I like to think about the oscillator of a watch or the balance wheel being like the heart, right? Mm -hmm. And the more regularly your heart beats, the better performing you are as a human being. So the, the true for a watch also, the more regular regularly your uh, oscillator beats, the more accurate it is, the more precise it is, so on and so forth, right? So then for me, and this is particularly pertinent because I'm on a diet now because I ate so much <laughs> pasta when I was in Venice, you know, well, when you eat and you're full of energy, your heart beats at a great regular rate, right? Mm -hmm. But then as throughout the day, you get stressed or you, you know, you get hungry and suddenly your heart is not performing at its optimum anymore because your energy is waning. And this is kind of like the whole adventure of watchmaking in terms of the pursuit of accuracy, right? Like you have these big spring barrels and then you've got an oscillator and there's like a whole space in between. There's these little wheels that are reducing it. And the problem is as the energy depletes here, somehow the impulse of this heart is not as regular, it's not as precise, and it starts to become weak. But you guys created something that was exceptional because you found a way that every impulse of the heart is being controlled by a device that is a silicon blade. It's a Nicolas Dehon, who's a, a bit of a legend now, certainly is Jera Perigo. He was holding a train ticket and it was curved, right? And he noticed that if you push it in one direction, it, it flexes and, and, and forms a, the opposite shape, right? All right? And he's like, you know, that's incredible because that's like a little, energy storage device that requires no like spring or anything like that. That's All right. it requires is a minuscule amount of pressure to unlock it from one position and flip it to the next position, right? And he's like, dude, I wonder if I could take that and use that to impulse a balance wheel in each direction. So he created this uh, wonderful framework made of silicon, right? I think it was made of metal initially because I saw like a, I have actually seen a picture of the prototype of that watch when it was made at another company whose yeah, name, name we'll, we'll, we won't mention. Great company. Yeah, a, a very green and it's got a big crown. Yeah. <laughs> but we, and we love them. Very respectable. Oh, well, they're the kings. So, <laughs> so, so uh, then I think that with the advancements in uh, technology, uh, when it came to Gerard Perigo, you guys were able to make it for the first time in silicon. And that's because first you can um, manufacture silicon with like a one microns precision, which is incredible, All right. right? And the other thing too is that uh, silicon has an indefinite fatigue life, meaning it will never get tired, it will never break. It, you can continue to use a spring in perpetuity, which is really cool, right? And then you guys design like this kind of escapement with two wheels and a detent lever, and the detent lever will impulse the balance wheel, but it's being driven at each impulse by this this blade the spring and that was revolutionary right because as you were talking about since like the beginning of time everyone's been trying to make a more accurate watch but the problem is 
um, the diminishment of power, as we were discussing, it's kind of like, okay, that problem we have as humans, I get hungry and I'm not feeling as, as, as strong. My heart is not beating as regularly. So everyone has tried different solutions for this and you guys were the first ones to do it. And that's amazing, right? This is obviously a quest for excellence in chronometry. So I think that what's really cool is that you have diminished the size of this watch. So let's talk about that maybe because sure. the initial watch, okay, which was launched in 2013, and that was a time when people like oversized watches, right? You know, like I know now everyone wants things smaller, but it's like, guys, at one point you you all wanted it larger. You all like make it bigger, <laughs> make it bigger. So 48 mm at the time, I think was a pretty uh, average size for a like, really complicated watch. And now you've managed to diminish the size. Tell me a bit about that adventure because I'm sure it was not easy. What's really interesting about JR Pregut, uh, for first and foremost, it's a high origin brand. It's right. We come from the high origin, and the bridges epitomize that. Yeah. And with the three bridges and the bridge collection, um, and this is a very good example of uh, of the uh, what could be done in a bridge collection. Obviously, we do have the three bridges in different iteration, and this with the uh, with the uh, constant escapement. So we we actually work a lot on the uh, on the on the case. And the case is very much the same shape and design that you have on the rest of the bridge collection, including the one we're going to talk about afterwards. Um, and and we, we also try to balance with the thickness of the movement. Yeah. The and so it's a glass box here. Uh, you, you see also a level of finishing we have on the titanium case. That makes it very light. Huh? You, you know, I have to say, that when I read the statistics, it's misleading because now that I have it on my wrist, it's more looks smaller. It first of all, yeah, yeah it, it wears super well. Yeah. Even though, like mathematically, it's forty-five mm, it doesn't feel like that at all. It feels basically like the right size for this watch yeah. that has this complication. Um, part of that also is that it, 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 you know, you've made it slimmer in appearance also because you're using a, a, what you're calling a glass box. Yeah. Um, but it's also like the ergonomics of the lugs and the integration into the bracelet as well is really well done because it fits great. And then as you're saying, the use of grade five titanium makes it really effortless to wear. And I think that that's really important today because like today, if you want to have like, a, you know, uh, I don't even know if I would call it a super complication, like a game changing watch that has an incredible visual identity on your wrist. That's that's awesome. But everyone demands that you be able to wear it all the time today. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this now, like you could, you know, like wear it all day long, especially with this great textile um, strap and it's effortless to wear. Right? I, you know, I mean, what you mentioned about being able to wear, uh, I mean, like even complication watches need to be wearable every day. This is really also my philosophy. I think we need to make watches yeah. that are readable, <laughs> reliable, ergonomic, but also, yeah, um, that you can wear all the time. And that actually, this is really a watch that, I mean, goes to, I think the, uh, the in terms of finishing to a very uh, high level of finishing, but also could be quite understated, which is good. It's exactly the right ratio and it's exactly what we stand for. I have to say you guys did a great job also. So um, you're talking about the bridges and I know this is a, a beautiful form shape that comes from your famous three bridge tourbillon, mm -hmm. um, but you've done a great job in integrating that here, right? So I see like immediately, I see an incredible bridge um, transversing the bottom of the watch, which is for the balance. And then maybe my favorite element is the same shape is being echoed into these two individual bridges for each of the escapement wheels. All right. And the whole bottom half of the watch is so vibrant and alive because you see this interplay between these escape wheels, the, the spring or the blade, and then the balance. And you can see it very clearly. You know, yeah. It's almost, I mean, you could consider it as being skeletonized at the bottom of the watch. Totally. And, uh, which, uh, which is very nice with the uh, power reserve indicator on the, on, the, on the left. Yeah, and then you've got a lateral power reserve yeah. indicator, which is something you took from the original, which I really like. Yeah. But I think that the big difference, the game changer here for me is the center, central hands, right? Yeah. Um, huge central luminous hands, and then you've got this massive uh, seconds hand as well, which I love because ultimately this watch is a chronometer. So to have a seconds hand right. makes such a huge difference as well. First time on, on my wrist, yep. thank you for lending me your watch, the Patrick version. Um, it's phenomenal on the wrist. Right? I'm really uh, what's the price, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, so this is a 95,000 Swiss francs. Uh, slightly above 100,000 USD. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated watch, or it's a very special watch. But and there's a price still, point, which there's is, a value there. Yeah, yeah there exactly. Yeah, right. I think you got another hit here in your hands, Patrick. Tell me a little bit about the partnership with uh, the Hourglass, uh, with one of my favorite dudes, Michael Tay, and like what it represents to you. Yeah, it represents a lot. I had the privilege to know Michael for um, for almost two decades, um, and, uh, and I, I consider the Hourglass as being. Uh, one of the best, if not the best retailer in the world. 
and they wrote more than retailers. I think the, the level of uh, knowledge and passion for watches is tremendous. Um, the, I think the, your, the experience you can get in an hourglass tour in various countries is great. Um, those guys are humble, passionate, um, very knowledgeable. They, they, I think they are they're also cool. I mean, they, they know a lot of watches and they are also independent brands. I mean, yeah. they're very strong within independent brands. And as you know, we are also independent. And, um, and yeah, I, I forget I, that sometimes. You're yeah, we are, we are independent. independent. Brand. Yeah, we're independent. Yeah, right. Right. We are, we are uh, an historical large indie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but um, the fact and, and the uh, the partnership is good. I mean, we we work very well with the with the hourglass here in Singapore, in Thailand, Malaysia, uh, in Vietnam now, and uh, we are about to open a boutique. We operate the boutique in uh, in Vietnam. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, and also in uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So it's a it's a quite a broad partnership. Very good. I mean, we are here in Singapore. We get some very nice stores, multi-brand stores. Um, yeah, and the same. I think we have the same vision. I mean, uh, Michael and his father and his family have built over time. Like uh, as I said, are, I think a fantastic uh, network in terms of uh, retail, and we'll continue to grow. And we see a very long partnership between our two companies. I, I That's awesome. you know, I'm a strong believer that the um, watch retailers. I mean, I. I want to keep uh, the brand working, Jean uh, but also the sister brand, but working with the top retailers in the world. That's what we do. Absolutely. And it has, um, I think it's um, it's very good to have that long term partnership. We are we fortunate to be in an industry where handshake and emotion are still very important. Totally. And it's true with different stakeholders, including the uh, some of our partner in distribution. So Good tell me job. a little bit about this, Patrick. What do we, what so, do we have here? So this one is actually the, the sixth edition of our partnership. Uh, with the uh, with Aston Martin, you know there there are plenty of partnership between cars and watch companies. Yeah, and uh, from my point of view, um, some few made a lot of sense, sure. or make a lot of sense, and and others less. But I think the uh, between Aston Martin and Japri Good, honestly, the alignment on values is very strong. Uh, and what's interesting, the two brands, historical brands, have actually on the same have the same momentum. And it's true, and people see it in Formula One now with the result of the Aston Martin team uh, this year, and I'm sure it's it's going to continue to improve, but also on world cars. And those guys are so good also in design. Yeah, so, they're beautiful. So we sets. work very closely. Yeah. Uh, we work very closely with St Aston Martin to uh, to uh, to actually we gave them the watch and we say, hey, design, make the changes you want to see. And uh, those guys are very good at that, and they've done a couple of changes. I mean, you can see it actually on the rotor or on the barrels. We are we are also on the bridge, and we are. This is in in his case. I mean, the color uh, replicate exactly the Aston Martin mm -hmm. and a British green. It's a very very interesting also painting. I mean, we have to. One of the challenges that you you cannot obviously on a color you cannot replicate the same process that you have on yeah, a car. Sure. <laughs> the same number of layers, etc. So we have to come up with a new process. To make the bridges uh, look the same, and what's interesting is when you play with the with the wash, you actually have a different uh, on on the aesthetic side. Sometimes it looks slightly blue, and mm. most of the time it's very British uh, green, yeah, uh, British racing green. That's fantastic, man. Well, congratulations on these two watches. I have to say the constant escapement. It's so nice to, get to actually hold it and wear it. Uh, it's it's an absolutely phenomenal watch. Yeah, it's brilliant. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Wade. Cheers, guys.